Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Pazanka and Scott Parkin. Welcome to the silky smooth sounds of the Green and Red podcast. I am your co host, Scott Parkin, in Berkeley, California today. And as always, I am joined by Bob Bazanko in Niles, Ohio. And uh, good to see you, Scott, today. We're doing something a, a little bit different. This week, the news came out, and this is something that some of us have known for a while. News came out this week that Noam Chomsky has had some serious health issues, and he won't be making a return to public life because a lot of people have been asking why they haven't heard him say anything about the horrors in, in Gaza. And so what we wanted to do today, and, and not in any kind of macabre way or anything like that, but just to show our appreciation. A lot of people have been doing that. You and I have been sharing tweets and posts and messages from all kinds of people talking about what he meant to them. And so that's what we wanted to do. He's been uh, a frequent guest. I think we've had him on, what, four times, maybe. Yeah. And uh, he's meant a great deal to both of us. And I think we'll probably start that way by just talking a little bit. And we've done this before on the show, but talk a little bit about like what he's meant. And I'll try to be brief because I've told this story so many times. I, I first made contact with him over 30 years ago. I, I came home from a research trip and there was a letter from MIT. And I'm thinking, no, I can't be. And it was actually, he had written, read an article I'd written and asked about it. And that began uh, for the next three plus decades, a, a series of fairly regular correspondence. I interviewed him many times back in the old days when I had a radio show in Houston on Pacifica. And then obviously during the the link, the lifetime of the podcast, we've had him on, we've talked about, what do we talk about? The 60s? 50th the, anniversary of the, the war in 50, Vietnam, 50th Vietnam. anniversary of the McGovern's loss and how the Democrats really swayed to the right. Yeah. And, yeah then, we, and then you had one of our most popular episodes ever. Then you talked to him about the legacy of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. That's... If there's anything, actually, that's the reason we met. He was working on Rethinking Camelot back in the early 90s. And I'd written an article about Vietnam, which included Kennedy stuff in it. So he contacted me. And that's probably the area where we corresponded the most and, and about. We we would often send each other articles. And if I saw something, I'd send it to him. And he would actually send me stuff. And we, we would chat and get really chatty and catty about people uh, on that. We've had the same opinions, I think, of many of them. So that was, yeah, really important to me to be part of that and, and to be associated with him was cool. To be called Chomsky's useful idiot by Oliver Stone's friends was really a feather, feather in my cap. And then the last kind of real contact I had with him was in early 2023. Uh, I think it was about this time last year when we stopped hearing from him. But in early 2023, I was out in Arizona for the better part of a week um, recording a master class with him. I got to be the a consultant and interviewer on it. I got to spend two full days with him talking about all kinds of stuff. The, the final cut only is like 40, 45 minutes long, and it doesn't go into a lot of detail. But we spent, I don't know, I think like six hours talking about linguistics and talking about media and dissent and intellectuals and all kinds of really cool stuff. I really can't say enough about the impact he's had on my life intellectually and personally, too, it's just nice, like when you're feeling down to be able to communicate and have him say, hey, you're doing good, or I agree with you or something like that. Sometimes those little kinds of affirmations help. And so it's just meant a lot to me personally. And I know you can talk about that, too. And obviously, to the larger left, he's had an immeasurable impact, I think. Yeah, I I obviously haven't known him as long as you and have had as a, deep as a relationship with him as you have. I first met him when we, as a group of activists, brought him in 2002 to Houston to speak to Houston. It was in the fall. I think it was October 2002. Yep. The, the build up to the Iraq war was happening. We hosted a, a huge speaking engagement for him. Uh, but before the afternoon, before he spoke that evening, we we had a, a group, the people who organized it, spent a couple hours with him just talking about the state of the world, which was a sort of like huge moment for me since then as a as an organizer i'll say over the years when i've done big organizing projects which which required a you know huge coalition and we would be getting endorsements from not just organizations but also from individuals he was always really quick to respond to me that of course i'll endorse uh, whether it was protesting the 
Capitol power plant over its burning of, of coal uh, in Washington, D.C., or the Keep It in the Ground campaign, which was a campaign I worked on a few years ago around uh, Obama policies. Uh, he was always very, he, he was just a generous person with his lending his larger than life name to, to support different causes, which as you get to know the history of and life and history of Noam Chomsky as a, a common thing. And that as we, one of the things I've been really taken by in the last week or so, since it's been a little bit more public that he's had to pull back from public life is all of the people who are talking about how they felt like they were nobody, but they sent an email to Noam Chomsky or before the internet, they wrote him a letter and he would always respond. And I, I was looking at some stuff this morning about some guy in 1995 who wrote Noam Chomsky about how do you keep hope? And he wrote him a long typewritten letter back talking about what you can do to keep hope up in this moment. At that point, it was around the Clinton foreign policy that all the Democrats and liberals thought was great because it was humanitarian, quote unquote. But as we know, if you listen to the Green and Red podcast, it was just another tip of the spear for intervention and empire. And so that I, I, the generosity and the kindness of Noam Chomsky is something that people often don't think about, but that's something I've been really taken by in the last week or so. And it's actually something that Bev Stoll, who we had on the show a few months ago in her memoir, actually talked about quite a lot. The other thing I, I want to say about Noam Chomsky, which I feel like really has become a little, has, has been a big influence on me is in, in, in her memoir, she talks a lot about the wobbly spirit. She talks about it in regards to Howard Zinn, and she talks about it in regards to Chomsky. And he talks about how part of what that is, is that you always take the side of the underdog, whether, and he talks a lot about miners who were massacred in Lawrence, Colorado, and miners who were massacred in Northern Chile. And he talks about how his father was wobbly. He came off the boat. He didn't even speak English. And then he joined the IWW. Chomsky saw himself as a second generation wobbly. But that wobbly spirit, I feel, is also what sort of has kept me going through all the years of activism and organizing that I've done. And I see and credit Chomsky. There are many who I credit as influencing me with that, but Chomsky is one of them. He also, I think, for people of your generation, younger never ran away from the idea that he was an anarchist and he spoke about anarchy in a, in a very positive way. And I would assume that had a, a big impact on you and a lot of people you work with in that generation too. Yeah, absolutely. There was, I was also looking up some of his writings and some of his quotes in preparation for today. I found this great quote about anarchism from him that where he said, that is what I have always understood to be the essence of anarchism, the conviction that the burden of proof has to be placed on authority and it should be dismantled if that burden is not met, cannot be met. And as someone who has a background in anarchist organizing, anarchist direct action, it's very much influenced by Chomsky. Chomsky is one of the, one of the great, better known anarchists in the world. And it's he's having a, a huge impact on people who go out and do stuff in the streets all the time. Yeah. I think one of, one of the great accomplishments he did was embracing terms that a lot of like liberals especially would run away from, right? He was never one to say, no, I'm not that. No, I'm not that. He took on difficult cause. And we're going to we're going to talk about that, too. But per what you mentioned a minute ago, how people are commenting on they emailed him in 1995 or, or whatever. I've seen a lot of people recently, just in the past few days, who said I was working on my dissertation and I told him about it. And I sent him the dissertation and I got back three pages of comments. And that is consistent with everything I've ever heard. He's done that for me. Right. right. He wrote letters of recommendation for me, which is still a huge feather in my cap. And also, I think what you mentioned is really important. Before he gave the big public speech in Houston in 2002, he met with all of you. And that's what he did. He wasn't, he had, didn't have an ego and he wasn't went to kind of the glamour and, and the, the kind of star aura about him. He would meet with local kids in Boston, high school students, activists, as much as anybody else. He didn't show favor just because you had a title or anything like that, you'd wait in line. Just like, and Bev told us a lot about the people who would come. He was like holding court. And he wasn't, you know, oh, no, you get to cut of the front of the line because you're special or something like that. He really just gave his time so generously and effortlessly. And I think that's uh, just important. So what I think we're going to do, uh, we've talked about this a bit, rather than talk about specific things he did, is just talk about a few areas in which I think 
he made major co- contributions and, and things that we should appreciate him for, right? A little bit and, of what um, Chomsky taught us is a little bit of yeah, that. what what he taught us and appreciation of what he taught us and what we know because of him. This is the person who's been called the most important public intellectual in the world in the 20th century. He is what is it like in the the fifth or sixth most cited person ever? Right, he's up there with Plato and Aristotle and you know Freud and Darwin. And yeah, and it's amazing he never acted that way, right? Like I said, didn't have an ego. Would talk to you, you know. It's a really kind of remarkable guy. We'll start with how he got started before he became the most important public intellectual or the most important dissident in the world. He actually made his bones by studying linguistics. And he emerged at a time when behavioralism with B.F. Skinner was the dominant form of linguistics. And it basically said that you came out as a blank slate and people turned you into something. They taught you language. They taught you knowledge. And Chomsky just basically threw a, a, a Molotov cocktail into that and said, no, it's all organic. And when I did the masterclass interviews, we spoke about this for two hours, which was really fascinating. And I think that's also important, not just because it speaks to a certain development in linguistics. People in that field talk about before and after Chomsky, right? And it's not something I'm, I'm not a linguist myself. But I think it also speaks to a lot of other stuff he did, especially his work on media critiques, right? And I know that's something that's meant a lot to both of us. We've read and many of his books, we've seen documentaries about manufacturing consent. And did he... It's one of his you know, most known books, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, with and Ed, Ed Herman. With Ed Herman. Ed, Ed probably wrote more of it than, than Noam did, actually. But I think the way we look at media, I, I, when you say that, the way we look at media on the left owes a, a massive debt to, to what he's done. Yeah. I And we've talked about this a couple of times, is that there's fake news that became popular with the rise of Trump. But Noam Chomsky and Ed Herman were talking about that decades before that got really taken on but in the right-wing media. And the right-wingers don't even know what they're talking about when they're talking about it. But like with manufacturing of consent, he's they are talking about how major media, which is dominated by corporations, which is dominated by the political class, are able to sway opinion, sway the conversation, sway the narrative. And it's if anything, it's as much of a factor as the power that the political class has, the power that politicians have to make legislation. It's as powerful as the military. It's as powerful as the police. And in, in many ways, when we see in like in, in these brutal authoritarian regimes, they are they just send the cops to crack down on dissent. In the US, it's much more nuanced and much more this sort of manufactured, this manufactured way of creating opinion some quotes from Chomsky, the smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow lively debate within that spectrum, which is our political system. And that's how it's, that's how it's presented to us on cable news on, on, and also on social media and the internet, although that's, that's moved, that is moving a little bit. And then he also said, that's the whole point of good propaganda. You want to create a slogan that nobody's going to be against and everybody's going to be for Nobody knows what it means because it doesn't really mean anything. Like support the troops, uh, which was like one of his points in 1991 during the first Gulf War. I think what's especially important, too, is that he told us about language and knowledge in terms of their application toward power, their uses for people in power. They, They don't just exist as they are in some kind of neutral intellectual universe. Language and knowledge are used by people in power, as you pointed out, to create propaganda and to tell us what to say and and how to think and to create that spectrum, which is pretty narrow and more narrow than ever. I mean, can you imagine in the past eight months what he would have been saying about the way the media, the the U.S. media is covering Palestine, Gaza, right? They immediately take a story up. They have no evidence for it. And a week or two later, it come out, there was no evidence for that, but it doesn't matter. It's already out there. And when they're focusing, everything is about Hamas and they're trying to ignore the fact that they're killing kids and killing hospitals and blowing up hospitals and killing nurses and killing teachers and all that kind of stuff. And that's what he did. There were a handful of people, I think, on the left. He talked about media, Ben Dagdiki and Ed Herman, of course, and then Noam, and, and there are others, right? And I think that's so critically important to be able to understand that even so-called liberal media is really part of this larger corporate system. And if you look at the kind of people who are sponsoring the media, sponsoring TV shows, it's these major corporations. So you're not going to hear people, the Washington Post, just fired uh, an editor, I mean, right? Because she was covering things that they didn't want covered. And this is, I think, really what's important to show us how 
at some point, you can be a liberal, you can be a conservative, you can be a Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. Because those forces that control what you think and what you say are going to be pretty bipartisan in that regard. And I think that's one of the most important things that that he taught us, right? Um, we're going to show a clip in a minute, but I don't know if uh, about a contemporary application, I think, of language. Uh, but I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that before we do it. No, I think you got it all. I, I would I, just that the, the the main reason that, you know, we see this sort of manufactured consent and this propaganda is so that the power holders can maintain power and, and that they don't have to send in the National Guard or the police to quell the troublemakers because... They control public opinion. I do think it's harder for them now in the advent of social media and things, but they still, that's what they do. Uh, that's why they're going after TikTok. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, to, to shut it down. Yeah, one of the, uh, actually, I think it's the most popular clip we've ever put out in an interview with him. Uh, and this is a more contemporary application of these ideas. We, we When we spoke to him a couple of years ago, we talked to him about the left specifically, language and knowledge on the left. And one of the things that's become very prevalent and very controversial in the last couple of years have been these ideas of things like identity politics, wokeness, and cancel culture, right? And on the left, we're seeing now ideas that we, I, I'm speaking for you, and I think you'll agree, would not consider to be kind of elements of free expression. They would be illiberal ideas. They would be ideas that would close the, the nature of debate. And obviously, Chomsky and, and all of us should know that the right and the corporate powers are far more potent on this issue, right? But it does occur on the left. And so what we're going to do is play a, a little bit of a clip of, of Noam talking about ID politics, cancel culture, wokeness, and the perils it shows, it poses for, for those of us on the left. Today, the left is often both characterized and, and, and mocked as this kind of woke left with cancel culture and identity politics. And I think there is some truth to that. How do you think that? That affects kind of the overall nature of, of organizing and, and these movements, which are working on issues in the streets. Please. Cancel culture, the woke culture, political correctness, their identity politics, they're all picking up on authentic issues. But uh, if you want to have a serious functioning left, these crucial issues have to be integrated into a much broader picture, which doesn't efface and in fact supports and, uh, the centers on class issues, which are right at the center of all of it. If those get effaced and you are just working on your own identity and how you feel about things, it's going to be harmful. It reminds me very much of the late 60s when authentic issues were being brought up that had been suppressed, like feminist issues, you know, they'd been way in the background. Okay, they were brought up as important, major issues, real ones, change the country. But when they're done in a way which undermines the joint efforts that we're all involved in on broader things, that can be disruptive and dangerous. We've got to, and I think that we're, we're seeing that now too. Of course, the right wing loves their it's cult, a gift. Yeah. the highest thing they can imagine. Yeah, because they can't. The right wing, for ever since Nixon at least, has understood the Republican Party. They cannot approach the public with their own policies. You can't go to the public and say, "I want to screw you. I want to give everything to the wealthy. Please vote for me." Some can't do that. So they just had to shift to what are called cultural issues. Somehow, if you can pick people up on white supremacy, misogyny, and racism, something like that, then maybe you can organize them. And unfortunately, that works. I don't know if you saw the article this morning in the Times on the Republicans and the QAnon. That's pretty scary when you look at the figures. And yes, that works. We've seen it in the past. But that's what they have to do. If the right wing is going to follow its policies of service to corporate power and ultra wealth, they're just going to have to shift the, gun, the yeah. discussion totally to these culture and so on. 
yeah. and you shouldn't be giving them that gift, aside from the fact that it's, it's wrong in the first place. Yeah, so I think that's a, a good contemporary application of the way that knowledge, language, power all work together. And I think it's something we on the left have to be uh, aware of, too. It doesn't mean you don't fight against injustices, but I think it's also important to know how to use that, which is actually a perfect segue into the next thing we wanted to talk about. One of the, the contributions he's made that, you know, for, for the entire left, but, but for us as well, which is his defense of free expression. And I know this has gotten him into a, a lot of hot water with especially with conservatives, but with liberals, too. He's pretty much an absolutist on free expression and free speech. He believes you have a right to say what you want. And then you have this dialogue and then you have this debate. You may even have an argument, an arena in which ideas are thought over. And obviously, when he started doing this, there was more of an arena than, than there is today. He's been attacked for this. Maybe most famously, he wrote a, a preface to a book about Paul Pot and the Khmer Rouge. And the book was an apology. It was uh, not terribly rigorous. Chomsky's preface was based on the idea that he has a right to say this. Chomsky never said he agreed with it or anything like that, right? And since then, for 40 years, he was attacked as an apologist for genocide, an apologist for Pol Pot. You still hear it all the time. He explained it countless times. It, it didn't matter, right? And that's the most extreme example of this. But I think that on the left, we're seeing that today. And that goes into the little clip we just saw about cancel culture and things like that. This idea that we have to be able to say what we need to say and that there are some things that need to be said, which may be uncomfortable. And I would like, I think this applies to us on our political community a, a little bit more, right? We know what the right wing is going to do. We know they're going to lie. We know, we know they're going to shut down campuses and get kids arrested and the university presidents are going to call in the police. We know all that. But on the left, how do you think that applies? You're in activist communities, and I'm not asking you to criticize activists or anything like that, but do you think that idea of free expression is still important, and, and or do you think it's in, in peril? In peril. I think that there's a move by people who have been targeting particularly right-wing figures to do what they call deplatforming them, uh, particularly on places like campuses and things like that. It's a pretty it's a pretty consistent strategy that I've been seeing people on the left do against right wing figures within 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 this sort of far right media sphere. Like where we saw like Kyle Rittenhouse and Ben Shapiro's student tour where he's been shut down. And, and I don't even know necessarily if I agree with the sort of free speech absolutist position, because I do think people like Kyle Rittenhouse should be shut down because I don't think they act, I don't really want to hear what they have to say. And I think that it's, he's a murderer and he got away with it, blah, blah, blah. But it's definitely something that has, it's very controversial. It's very heavily debated. And, but I think it's a, I, I think as far as like free speech goes, it's, it is important that people can be heard. So there's that too. I'm just, I have distaste for particular um, positions. Yeah. I don't have any problem with shouting down Rittenhouse and running him off the stage either. And that there, there's an element of free expression, right? If you're, if he's allowed to come there and say what he says, then we're allowed to shout at him, and yell at him, and things like that. I think there are some other, and he killed two people. He shot two people, so we know he got that, away right? with it, and got away with it. We know that. So I think that's. But I think in general, and I've noticed that uh, on the left, and I'm in a different world than you. Although you and I probably come out of the two kind of most stereotypical left communities, right? The activist world, the academic world. So we're knee deep in it all the time. Right. And I have noticed a lot of people in, in the academic world who are less open to having kind of free thought, less open to having different ideas. And I've just, I think it's dangerous. And I think when Chomsky gets attacked, he was attacked heavily in 2016 because he said that he, Donald Trump scared him and he think he encouraged people to vote for Hillary Clinton. That's not a position I really agree with. I hated Hillary Clinton, right? I hate Joe Biden. Right. I'm not a fan of Clinton or Obama. But it's a legitimate position to hold. And for him to be attacked the way he was for that, I thought was way over the edge. I mean, he, he believes that you have a right to, in this particular case, he envisioned Trump as being such a grave threat and so insane. He's not wrong, right? He's not wrong that a, a vote for Clinton was worth it, right? And he's not under any illusions about what the liberal Democrats have done. But I think that kind of defense of free expression, the idea that you can have an open mind, that you shouldn't be attacked. I don't think he would include Rittenhouse in that. I think Chomsky probably thought 
kill two people. The hell with the kid. I don't know. I'm speaking for him, but but that defensive free expression, I think, is a bit under siege. And unfortunately, the people who have become the champions of it are these goofballs like uh, Joe Rogan and Bill Maher and. When they've managed to, and Republicans who victimize themselves, they're canceling me, that kind of shit. And yeah, that's not yeah. what he meant, right? That's not what he meant at all. If you want to throw a milkshake at Andy, no, I'll, I'll buy you the ice cream, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying that. I think it's more yeah. along the lines of, I think the the controversy is around whether whoever can speak at, at a college campus or in a, in a public venue without being shouted down or deplatformed. And I think if people want to go to a place where someone's being platformed and shout it down, then that's as much free speech as absolutely as them being able to speak. So yeah. that's a little bit of how I look at it. Maybe Kyle yeah. Rittenhouse was a bad example, but it's just a recent one that I had noted. Chomsky did say, if we don't believe in freedom of expression for people we despise, then we don't believe in it at all. Yeah. The other thing, I, the other issue, the more recent Chomsky thing I've noted is around Ukraine and Chomsky came out and was very critical as he is known for. He's very critical of U.S. empire and talked about how Putin invaded Ukraine basically because of this, because of U.S. policy. And even posting things about Chomsky's health, I've noted that he not only is getting called out as being pro-genocide because of what he said about Pol Pot decades ago, but they're also saying that, that he supports totalitarians like Putin and he has these horrible policies on Ukraine. He still has the right to say it, right? I agree with him. I don't agree with the NATO liberals as we have, you know, as we have coined the term, but they but they think that he shouldn't be saying anything. And we see like institutions like the New York Times silencing critics of US foreign policy around Ukraine and Russia for exactly these reasons. It's one thing to go shout down Kyle Rittenhouse and then you're called that you're anti-free speech. What about the New York Times not talking about it, silencing people like Seymour Hirsch, sil doing hit pieces on activists like Jody Evans and Lisa Fithian? That's more anti-free speech than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when we talk about the defense of free expression, that's really what we're speaking about. We we spoke to him on in our interviews with him about Ukraine more than once. Mm -hmm. And it's a position that, that we've taken here as well, that that war needs to end. It's a bloodbath. And it's not serving anybody's interests except for like the military industrial complex and NATO. Yeah, that, that's clearly important. I have, an, I have another p a quote I pulled from yeah. him, which I think is really relevant to this, which I think is really important to what we're saying, which is he, he once said, I was never aware of any other option but to question everything. I, I, I think that's the important piece here, too, is that we can platform people that we despise their opinions and despise who they are. But then we need to be able to question that in a rigorous sort of way, yeah. whereas people are just afraid to do that. Yeah. And when my generation, I was influenced by him, Gabriel Coco, William Atman Williams, Walter Lefebvre, Marilyn Young, a bunch of people like that. And that's a key element of it. You take this particular issue and you figure it out and you look into it and you get as much information as you can out of it. And that's what he means by free expression. The way, and I, this particular discussion with me and you, I think is really, we're talking more about kind of liberals and people who would call themselves on the left, right? Who support Ukraine who want to ban Russian artists from coming into the United States and want to prevent you from playing Prokopioff and silly stuff like that. And of course, then you have the, the kind of liberal establishment right now, which is just as horrific as it's ever been on issues like Israel's genocide or the protest here at home on campus. Well, yeah, I mean, gotten into a free expression around Zionism and anti-Zionism right. and the way in which that's being weaponized to just to smother free speech in the U.S. Yeah, one one time right after, I think it was after we we finished filming, I was chatting with him. He'd mentioned Kenneth Roth, who had been from, I think come from Human Rights Watch, maybe, had was being was taking a job at Harvard and Harvard was trying to get rid of him because he had been mildly critical of Israel, right? And that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. If there's any area where cancellation really applies, it's Israel, right? There are laws saying that you can't support BDS. People are being fired for using the word genocide to describe what what Israel is doing. Whenever people ask Chomsky if the word genocide applied, he would say it's used so loosely that I'm not sure. But clearly he identified a massive ethnic cleansing, a massive slaughter. This is way before October 7th, 2023. He also said that apartheid is too mild a word to describe Israel, that it was way worse than what he saw in, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And liberals today, the liberal establishment, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Democratic Party, all these people have really drawn the line there. And talking about gatekeeping, right? 
and you can't say much of anything anymore critically without being attacked as being anti-Semitic or pro-Hamas or, or whatever. And clearly he was, he would be outraged by that. He would be pro -Putin, absolutely outraged. Pro -Hamas. Pro Putin, right. Pro right. Hamas. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I get that myself. We've gotten that too. We and the comments and things like that. I may have got it today. <laughs> yeah. And and clearly he was attacked for all that. I think the Pol Pot one is just it's brought out all the time because it's so big. And it just shows like the power of these right wing media, not just right wing, liberal media too, because a lot of liberals have attacked him for that. And I pointed out for years now, read what he did. He described, he explained it. He's just read the preface, the intro. It's a defense of free expression, right? I also want to say that this is important for listeners as as news about Chomsky's health is out and he could pass away at some point. And this is what the Chomsky haters are going to be bringing up. Yeah. And so hopefully people are hearing this and taking this lesson. And whether you already want to mount a rigorous defense of what Chomsky said or not, but just keep in mind what he actually said about in this piece on, on Pol Pot. Yeah, because right now we're clearly in this bizarre world where the Republicans and Trump have started calling Biden and Kamala Harris the radical left and socialists. So we're in this bizarre world where these things don't really apply. These descriptions don't really apply. But the left shouldn't be taking part in this. They should not be denying free expression. They shouldn't be attacking and trying to cancel people who call for a, a, an end to these uh, uh, horrors in Ukraine, who attack Israel as we should. And they're, all they have left really is anti-Semitism, really. There's not a lot left because everything else has been exposed as a lie, right? Mm. And then even in my world, in the academic world, you have a lot of people who get more than upset if you say something that kind of strays away from their views. And it could be on things like class, it could be on race, not really class so much, more like race and gender and stuff like that. If you even express like some kind of circumspection about certain issues your attack. You could be racist, you could be sexist or whatever. And that's just a dangerous road. We know the right wing does it, but people on the left, professors, activists should not be doing that. We should recognize that we are different. And that doesn't mean you can't shout down Kyle Rittenhouse. Go for it, man. I'm all for it. I'll, I'll buy you a bullhorn. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I think that there are clearly uh, questions about free expression, about canceling that, that need to be addressed. And that's why we brought it up with him and we talk about it a lot because on the left, I think it's an issue. I think it's, and a lot of people get mad at me for saying it's a real thing. Like they want me to deny it's even a problem. I've seen people put out petitions to get like a mural removed. I think it was in San Francisco. There was a mural that had pictures of like slaves and Indians. It was a mural of U.S. history painted by a communist, right? And they wanted it removed. And I was like, that's insane. And I got attacked for that. Well, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about here, where we have to be more open about that. That doesn't mean we don't have the power to get into a, a, a shouting match with the right and with the corporate class. We just can't do that. But on our own, in our turf, we have to be more understanding. We have to be more aware of that. And there are people who say obnoxious things. And yeah, you have every right to shout them down and to disagree with them and to call them names and stuff like that. That's free speech. That's free expression. But at the same time, I think we do need to be a little more careful and have a, a lot more diversity of opinions as well in that regard, which kind of segues into the next thing we do, which kind of leads into the next thing you do, which for us individually and as podcast creators, is really important, which was his understanding of liberals. And I think it's maybe I, one of the main themes of this show. I think it is the main theme. And I can't think <laughs> of, I mean, I, I can't think of anyone who's done more to teach me about this than Noam. And we did a whole interview on the first time we talked to him, we talked from for over an hour about the 60s, right? And that was a big theme in it because the 60s was the Vietnam, especially, was a liberals war, right? That was the time of liberals. And this is the time that people still look back on with all this great nostalgia, right, especially about Kennedy and others. And I think his understanding of liberals is really critical here. And it's taught us a lot. We have a couple of clips to show. But before that, maybe you could add to, to that idea, like how, what he's meant and what he's taught us about how to analyze this political system rather than just doing it in this binary liberal versus conservative, Democrat versus Republican kind of way. Right? First of all, it goes a little back a little bit to what we were talking about when we were talking about like media language and media critique, which is it's a very narrow spectrum in which they've created. It's a binary, a narrow binary, which they've created and they allow lively debate there. So it's the Democrats, which are the liberal Democrats, which the right, you know, present as the radical socialists or the, the <laughs> radical left or, or what have you. But when we talk about when we talk about liberalism, we're talking about, first of all, historically, both parties come out of a liberal tradition. 
and if you looking back at the 19th century, but it's also important that liberalism is more of an economic philosophy more than anything else. And it's about expanding markets. And so liberals want to do that. A simple way to look at it is liberals want to expand markets. They're into foreign intervention. They're into promoting capital, both domestically and abroad. They're both into wage labor, but then they're also the liberals might be a little bit more open to reform, although today's Democrats don't really seem to be that much into reform of the system the way in which they may have been during the New Deal era or the Great Society. But then I, I think it's important to to note that they also are as in love with their own power as, as Reagan, Bush, or Trump. And Chomsky's critique is that it's an anti-working class sort of position despite what they tell us. It's an anti-civil rights position, despite what they tell us. And Chomsky has been like one of the biggest critics of liberals. He's also quite critical of conservative Republicans as well, and talks about them being the sort of, they spell the, the end of the world if we're like, we're really looking at it. But he's also very critical of, of everything that liberal Democrats has done. He He's been critical of the war in Vietnam. He's been critical of Carter's policies towards Central America and other parts of the world. And he's been very critical of the Clintons and the Obamas and the Bidens. And even though he's not been able to speak out about what's happened in the last year or since October, I'm sure he's very critical and horrified by what we see liberal Democrats doing as far as like support for the Israeli genocide of Palestinians and in Gaza. Yeah, I, that I was a long, that was very long winded. I hope that was No, okay. that's perfect. No, I recently saw an interview uh, not long ago with uh, Norman Finkelstein, who said that since Noam has been absent from this debate, when people ask him a question, he thinks, okay, what would Chomsky say about this? What would he? What would his analysis of this be? And I don't think anybody's spoken more passionately about uh, Israel and, and Palestine than he has, right? He is among Zionists. He's probably number one on their hit list, right? They despise the guy, right? Self-hating Jew, I, I think is what they call him. Self-hating Jew, self-loathing Jew, right? When he's been to Palestine, that's another part of this, because we were talking about how a lot of people criticize him and attack him. He's been to Palestine countless times. He was in Vietnam. He was in Laos. He's been to Cuba. He's been to South Africa. He was, when in, 20, in 2002, when we were waiting for him to come to Houston, about a week or so before that, he was in Turkey because a publisher of his was on trial. He went there to sit in the courtroom to show support for it. I remember talking to Bev Stoll at the time saying, well, he's got to be in Houston. He can't be. He can't get arrested in Turkey, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. So he's been on the front lines uh, of all this. And he, the way he described liberals and the way he described the power structure just meant so much to me. I, had, I was reading him and his analyses around the same time I was reading. I got turned on to see Wright Mills, who's critically important all this. Wright Mills maybe one of the most underappreciated or underknown uh, left scholars, right, in that era. And they both taught so much about the way power is constructed, the way power is developed, the way it's wielded, and how liberals are part of that. Essentially, they liberals and, and conservatives believe in kind of the same core, the same they have the same core values. And liberals, just like you said, they want a little bit more reform. They want to stabilize the system. They believe that you can harmonize class interests rather than crush them all the time. And that's Hard to find in the last three or four decades because the Democratic Party just has tacked so much to the right that they're doing the same things. And now and what we're seeing on campuses with these protests, these are occurring in Democratic cities, university administrators, and universities are generally considered liberal institutions, teaching a liberal education. Those are all gone now. And I think if you read Chomsky, if you listen to him, this would not be a surprise. And I, I've talked to a lot of people. I've read a lot of people who are shocked by this, and it shouldn't be, right? This is your life, right? You've dealt with these forces as an activist for a quarter century, right? And I know that in your particular regard, liberals and conservatives alike have made your life more difficult, right? Yeah. If, if we look at some of the kind of like bigger protest moments and in my life, one, I think more radical organizing actually has more opportunity during democratic administrations. But if we look at the anti-corporate globalization movement and the moment that's big moment that it had in November 1999, the, the government under the Clintons cracked down on that movement, right? After the battle in Seattle, lots of in, any sort of anti-globalization protest that was happening in the U.S. We had the FBI surveilling people. We had Democratic mayors in Democratic cities, Washington, D.C., Seattle, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, sending in the 
this is just 99 and 2000 sending in the the sort of shock troops to crush them uh same with obama is the obama department of homeland security coordinated a huge attack on occupy wall street camps in the 2011 2012 and put them all out of business like in one fa- fell swoop working with democratic mayors in a lot of cities uh but also like probably republicans as well and then what we see now and also the standing rock what happened at standing rock was also under obama and even though obama denied some permits around it towards the end of what was happening in standing rock still the sort of the police violence that we see happens under in the last year of the obama administration and then what we see now with the Biden administration, with these liberal administrator, liberal university administrators going after their students on like dozens of campuses around the country, and you know, even campuses where these elites come from are Columbia, UCLA, Brown, Harvard, MIT. All of them are being cracked down on, and I think actually all the ones I just named are also like those are liberal states, liberal cities, Liberal, liberal universities. Yeah. Yeah, Adams and yeah, all, yeah, absolutely. And that's the that's not in red state. That happened in red state America too, like yeah. University of Texas. It was pretty brutal. Yeah, so, there, there's particular viciousness with Greg Abbott, but but Kathy Hochul is doing the same things, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're surveilling students. They're Gavin Newsom withholding yeah. degrees. Gavin Newsom, all that along these lines too, with this idea of liberal. And uh, I noticed a lot of people who would consider themselves like radical lefties, lefter than thou people, in 2016 really attacked them. You're nothing but a liberal. You're nothing but a democratic apologist. The uh, the Oliver Stone crowd calls Chomsky a CIA stooge, which is like insane, right? He would just laugh. He's like, what, what, he, every time I would bring that up, he's like, why do you argue with these people? They're never going to change their minds. I know, I'm just venting to you about it. But uh, what struck me is these people like on the left who were attacking him in 2016 for saying you should vote for Clinton or in 2020 for saying you should vote for Biden. And they've ignored everything he said in his entire life about liberals. Like they're acting like he doesn't know. They say he doesn't realize. No, he actually realizes more than you ever will. Because when we talked about that, especially those Harvard days in the early 60s with the Bundys and McNamara and Roswell Gilpatrick and all these guys making the commute back from Cambridge to D.C., Schlesinger. I think that's really critical. We have a a, a couple clips we're going to show on that. Um, the first one is about the right wing nature of U.S. politics, because I think that re- uh, uh, gets to this, where he discusses how American politics, whether it be Democratic or Republican, is, is really pretty similar. Right. And so I think we have that queued up. and We're going to play a little clip from that one. If you take a look at American politics, there's a lot of talk about polarization and divisiveness. It's very misleading. If you take a look at the United States on a comparative basis, compare it with other wealthy countries. U.S. is far to the right. Mm-hmm. Take, say, Bernie Sanders. There was a, one of the editors of the Financial Times, the world's leading business journals, half-jokingly, only half-jokingly, said that if Bernie Sanders was in Germany, he could be running on the Christian Democrat yes. part the program, the Conservative Party. And if you look at his programs, that's true. Universal health care, free higher education, maternal leave. Who doesn't have that? Mm-hmm. Everybody has it. But what's called radical in the United States is yeah. you don't even talk about it in yeah. other, not even rich countries. Take Brazil, not a rich country. Uh, four months of guaranteed maternal leave. Uh, two months more if you ask for it. Uh, every country in the world has it except a couple of uh, Pacific Islands in the United States. The free mm-hmm. higher education, Mexico, Germany, Finland, it's not a, a health care, universal health care. You don't need to talk about it. All right, folks. And so just a kind of good segue from us talking about liberals is... A, a big topic that we have talked about a lot on the Green and Red podcast, including debates with some of Oliver Stone's goon squad, as I like to call them, goofy goon squad. Flounder and Pinto. <laughs> Flounder and Pinto is around conspiracies and deep state theories that you think would come just from QAnon and the far, but there's actually an element of people who probably identify as left or liberal who have really taken this on the most 
famous person being Oliver Stone, who made a huge movie about it in the early 90s called JFK. But there's a whole cottage industry. And so Chomsky has been one of the more prominent critics of that. I would say Bob Bezenko is also a very prominent critic of the JFK conspiracy theory. But in one of our probably our most popular episode ever, Bob actually talks with John, with Chomsky about about uh, the J, about JFK and JFK conspiracies. It, it was when Oliver Stone had re- released a new, and I'm doing air quotes if you're listening to this on audio, uh, documentary about the JFK conspiracy. And this is actually a clip where Bob is talking to Chomsky about how left media, also there's a lot of people in left media, not just within the Oliver Stone goon squad who promote a lot of this JFK conspiracy stuff. So you should definitely check out this clip. Just one last thing to people on, let's say on the left, who are writing favorably about Stone's work and about the Kennedy conspiracy, what would you say to them? And it's recently been a counterpunch, Jacobin, majority party, all kinds of so-called liberal places who are buying into this too. What would you say to them? Look at the record. Look at the record. Okay. You guys are intellectuals. You're educated. You know how to read documents. You know how to read newspaper reports. Take a look at it. Instead of you can, you can read Rethinking Camelot. Or your book. Same I thing. Your book on the uh, war managers. You, you don't like. You don't believe what's in the books. Fine. Go look at the record. You're public. Just to tap on the key on the internet, you can find it all. Yeah, I think if there's one area I actually have been associated with them, it's been on this issue. And this is probably the most, the topic we've most discussed over the years. And I think it's very important. In fact, the last kind of series of exchanges I had with them last spring were about this. We were going to do a whole show on conspiracies, just on conspiracy theory, not just JFK. And we were chatting about that quite a bit. And we were going to, he was going to come on and we were going to talk about that. And I think this is become more important than ever in the past couple of years. We've seen this proliferation now on the left. Uh, it's it's not new, as you point out, the JFK conspiracy theory is the big one, but you have 911 conspiracies, you have COVID conspiracies, all kinds of stuff like that. And, you, there's the who, Q, and the QAnon ones too, which is a QAnon, mix of all of them. Just, I'm talking about on the left though, right? QAnon, oh, yeah, we, yeah. Do, do, we do describe more as a right-wing conspiracy, but there are these, there's these left-wing conspiracies too, right? Um, and and what they do, and, and one thing that Chomsky always pointed out, which is really important, is that they absolve the ruling class of what it's doing, right? You have this deep state with a few bad people, and that implies that there are a lot of good people out there. The deep state has to make sure that the good people don't do good things, which is preposterous, right? And one thing that Chomsky's taught, me at least, and, and probably others, is that the capitalist class doesn't need to do that, right? They don't need a deep state. They don't need to have these kind of subterfuges and subversions. They do it, right? Because that's part of what ruling classes do. But it's probably easier just if you want to understand why things are happening to look at what Wall Street is doing, what the Senate is doing, what the Supreme Court is doing, what major unions are doing. There's a a logical explanation for all this and for people to resort to these conspiracies, to this idea that there's a deep state, right? Lurking around, killing a president, right? I can't stress that enough. Killing a president of the United States is a really fucking big deal. You don't do that casually. You don't do that capriciously. You don't do that over a little disagreement, a snit over Operation Northwoods or something like that, right? And so for them to latch on to these ideas, right, that the Bush and Cheney set up 911 because they wanted a war in the Middle East. You know how easy it is to start a war in the Middle East? We're seeing it, right? You don't need to blow up the headquarters of global capitalism to start a war in the Middle East. You can do that with McGeorge Bundy's famous line, right? Play cooser like streetcars, right? You can find something every 15 minutes, a new one will come along. And and yet this reaches hold. I have had lefties get angry, like spewing, spitting angry with me when I said 911 was a, a hijacking. What's so hard about that? Like, and, and as Chomsky once pointed out, that's more radical, right? That people hated the United States so much that they would hijack airplanes and blow up buildings. That's pretty bad, right? So why go look for this kind of massage CIA conspiracy uh, about it, right? And I think that's one of the things that, especially in the last few years, has really got, got me worked up. And I, I would suspect in the last couple of years, probably the, the biggest topic of conversation between us was about this. We exchanged stuff. So 
I think that's really critical to understand that in his words, which took out of grad school in history, right? Look at the record. And that's one thing that I think when I talk to the, or debate or whatever you want to call it, the, what do you call them? The goon squad? Oliver Stone's goon squad. <laughs> the goon squad. Uh, the, the assassinologist. Uh, that's pretty much my response all the time. Look at the record. But so-and-so said this to so-and-so who said it to this person. And 30 years later, there was an oral history where so-and-so said this, and Nixon said this, and Johnson said this, right? Look at the record. There are gazillions of documents out there, and I've read far too many of them, and what they suggest is nowhere to be found in the record, right? Yeah. And yet, what? and so what they're positing is that there's this cover-up because Kennedy was killed by the government, by other government actors, right? And what do they want? They want the government to release the documents that would prove that there was a government assassination, a government cover-up, right? And it's preposterous, right? And I think that one of the things that he's done, which I think really we need to extract and, and always be aware of, is that you don't need to find these kind of subterfuges and conspiracies and this deep state fingerprints all over the stuff. This is how power acts. This is how the ruling class acts, right? One of the most important lessons I've learned from Chomsky, and, and it's related to conspiracies, is there's where they control the narrative on the front page of the New York Times. But if you want to know what the ruling class is up to, read the business section of the New York Times. And that's for, there's no subtlety. There's no behind the scenes there. If Halliburton is you know getting permits to go do work in Dubai or in Riyadh or what have you, that's the ruling class at work there. There's no conspiracy. There's no deep state. The CIA runs covert operations around the world. Yeah, for sure. But it's not... It's not the sort of ma evil machinations and the smoke-filled rooms like the assassin. I forgot that I had been calling them that back then. The assassinologists to present it as. Well, on things like covert ops and subversion, there, there can be people who disagree with that in government. We're seeing that now. Six people, I think, have resigned from various diplomatic and military posts because of what Biden is doing in Gaza, right? But the fact is that those covert operations, that subversion, those kinds of things that people would say, oh, they're deep state conspiracies. That's policy. That's what the government does. And there are actually very few people who disagree with that. Right. So the premise of the JFK thing, and by the way, at the very end of this whole thing, this whole episode, we're going to play an extended clip of uh, Chomsky talking about Kennedy's legacy, because I think that's important. Right. But the way that they kind of project this is that there are there's this huge disagreement and there are these good people who want to do good things. Kennedy wants to end the war in Vietnam. Kennedy wants to stop the attack on Cuba. Kennedy wants to get out of the Cold War. And as Noam said, famous, three famous words, look at, or four famous words, look at the record, look at the record. That's not in there. That's nowhere to be found in there. Yeah. And so these covert operations, that's policy. I remember years ago in grad school, somebody told me, uh, a professor told me, it's not conspiracy, it's just policy. And I think that's important to even today to remember, because basically you're looking for heroes, right? Kennedy is a hero or some whistle. There are people who are here, Daniel Ellsberg, Noam Chomsky, these heroic people, right? But the way that the state operates doesn't rely on these deep, deep state smoke filled rooms. And I think that's important to understand because it, it really gives us this false sense of security that there are good people out there. It has us looking for heroes and making heroes out of people who, JFK, who are not heroic. And again, we'll put that clip at the end. But uh, this is something that I've really been talking about a lot in the last couple of years, especially with the resurgence of Stone. And when you debate these folks, and every time I would debate them, or I would say, sir, or write an article, I would send it to him and he would just laugh. He was like, why do you think you're going to change it? I was like, well, I don't think I'm going to change their mind, but you know, we have to get it out there. But he said, and that's what he said, is they're as bad as QAnon. Yeah. And in that particular regard, they're not violent, luckily, and they're not they're not going to stage a January 6th kind of excursion, well, a tourist a tourist thing in the Capitol, right? Just a, but, bunch, uh, of, a bunch of guys, just a bunch of guys on, a bunch of people on yeah. tour through the Capitol. It's not, nothing, yeah. Trump's, the, Trump's nothing gonna to pardon, see. Trump's going to pardon them for that reason, right? But at any rate, I know that, and you probably run into that, especially I think among younger people, these ideas uh, are, are becoming more, more popular, right? In your particular line of work, right? Who do you take on? You take on the banks, you take on the insurance companies. You're not going to Coconut the oil Grove companies, or the oil companies. Oil companies. Yeah. You're not, you don't need to go to Coconut Grove and Davos, which are not conspiracies. That's just, those are ruling class meetings, right? Mm. That's like the five families meeting in, 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 in upstate New York, right? They do that. It's open, right? And so to go looking for these things and to get into these 
massive debates over the temperature at which the steel in the World Trade Center would have melted just takes us away from the fact that the United States conducted affairs in the Middle East in such a, a, a heavy handed and violent and imperial way for so long that on September 11, 2001, people said, OK, we're, we're going to do something about it. Right. And I would put that in the same category as, as Hamas on, on October 7th, 2023. At right. some point, you don't have to like these people, right? I'm sure Chomsky would condemn what Hamas did in some way or other. He probably would. Finkelstein has, right? But the fact of the matter is, you ignore the reasons for that at your own peril, right? You may not like it, but clearly there's a long historical reason behind it, right? In this particular case, you have 75 years of Nakba behind it, right? And you don't need to go looking for these conspiracies and deep state machinations and fingerprints and smoke filled rooms. And Richard Helm said this and Alan Dulles did this and so on and so forth. Right. I keep going back. Mac Bundy played Cooser like three cars. You don't need conspiracies. You can just stuff happens. Right. There's mm -hmm. always a reason to do so. That's how the ruling class operates. That's my particular rant for the day. So. Yeah. <laughs> also talking about government policy around covert ops banks and oil companies they have their own policies which are to do business that's going to make them more money and for oil companies it's doing business in the middle east yeah. and for banks it's investing in those oil companies and there's no there's no conspiracy there that's just how they do business that's why you should look at the business section if you mm -hmm. really want to have a better understanding of what the ruling class is doing that's based on the logic of capitalism what they're doing makes perfect sense and again like who are these good people who are trying to prevent them from doing that? They're, they're not there. No. That's the part of this that I think is a conspiracy implies that bad people are overturning the good, beneficent acts of other people. And, and that's just not happening. Right. Yeah. And Kennedy yeah. clearly wasn't doing that. We have talked about it. And I looked at the record. I read the documents. I, I know how to do that. I know how to read a document. I would I would clearly say brag and maybe not. I could read a document better than Oliver Stone and Eugenio and Aaron Good and Pinto and Flounder and all those guys. I know how to read documents and how to find documents and I look at documents. I've been doing it my whole life, right? It doesn't require any particular skill. I mean, go, you go to an archive, you tell the archivist what you want to see, you find it. Now you can go online and find most of this stuff too. And I think it's important, especially for people on the left, especially for younger people, to take this kind of systemic analysis of what corporations do, right? What was it today? Did you send me a a tweet maybe from somebody who attacked Chomsky saying, I asked him this question about corporate influence in politics and he couldn't answer it or something like that. Was that, did you but, send me that? Yeah, it was about the rise of the financial sector that Chomsky seemed to just ignore that happened. Yeah, he had no idea that happened, right? <laughs> Jesus Christ. So, I mean, so if you read, there's a great book called Requiem for the American Dream, which they actually made a movie about, which features Chomsky and his thoughts on banks and the financial institutions, which we're talking about 1997 deregulation. We're talking about all the ensuing crises that happened as a result of that. And Chomsky, he blew me off on a when I called into a radio talk show and he I stopped following him because he didn't seem to be interested in talking about that. Yeah. I, by the way, the guy who was saying that identifies as a libertarian and yeah. was an anti-vaxxer. So shocking yeah. that he doesn't really understand how to look at facts and understand yeah. things or read things. We still need to do a show on conspiracies and, and the deep state. I've been, it would have been a lot easier with Noam because he could have done all the work and I have to just ask him questions or something like that. But we'll have to do that because I think that's really important. All right. Yeah. We've got one more thing to talk about, which is in many ways, I think something he's known for as probably as well as anything else. One of the most and important lessons we've learned from him. Yeah. And we've learned a lot and we're just talking about a handful today. There's so much more to it. And like I said, this is an appreciation. We're not trying to be macabre, but what's clear, he's had some serious health issues and he hasn't spoken publicly for about a year now. And it, it's a sad part of life. But uh, I think to appreciate what he did and to understand that and at some point, like you said, the knives are going to come out and you're going to have this. Everybody has a kind of contested legacy. And I think it's important just to have this stuff out there. And they're, and they're already um, coming out, just to be clear. And they're already coming out. Yeah, they yeah. are. And there's some, the haters are out as well as, as the admirers. And it's just, you know, important. And we've been like so fortunate to have this kind of, you know, intellectual relationship, this media relationship with him. And I've known him for some time. He's just been like incredibly helpful. So I wanted to do this. And finally, the last thing we want to talk about, the last kind of contribution is one of the, which he's really in many ways, probably as well known for as anything else, which is his, his uh, advocacy for what's called intellectual self-defense. And quite often people will use the phrase speaking truth to power when they discuss Noam Chomsky. It was funny because Chomsky himself was cautious with that term because he said, the people in power already know the truth. 
which also speaks to that deep state conspiracy issue, right? You don't have to tell them the truth. They already know it. We have to tell the truth to each other. We have to get each other to believe in that. But I think that's really critical uh, to understand this kind of concept of intellectual self-defense and truth power. And I know that's what both of us do in different worlds. You do it more directly in terms of direct actions and protests and so forth than I do it in what I teach and what I write, right? And again, what does that mean to you? What has he taught you and what you do about how important it is to be able to attack people, to be able to challenge them, to have the kind of knowledge and information you need, the language and knowledge you need, right? Going back to the very first point we brought up, to speak truth to power or to try to get truth out there to everybody else to understand what people in power do and what they know. I mean, I think in the world of organizing, it, it plays out in probably a couple of different ways. One, as we are you know, campaigning and putting pressure on the ruling class, on power holders, on bankers and oil execs and politicians, is to be able to speak the truth and speak truthfully and, and say it and expose the lies in which they're saying, I, I, I think is like a really important part of what the left on the ground, at least in the U.S. does. In many ways, we're a protest movement. In many ways, we're a movement where we're just saying no. But that's because the, the bad is so overwhelming that we need to be doing that. And so from what we you know learned from Chomsky is that it's our responsibility. And I, I don't even want to say that everyone who's doing this, who are part of the organization work I do are like necessarily intellectual, but they do all recognize the importance of speaking truth, exposing lies, putting going after the ruling class and the role in which the ruling class plays in how bad the world is right now, whether it's crises in the Middle East or the climate crisis or the economic crisis or, or what have you. And then a, another lesson I think we've learned from Chomsky is what I referred to earlier, which is this sort of like spirit, wobbly spirit, which is we take up the cause of the underdog, the people who are being persecuted in other parts of the world, people who aren't able to stick up for themselves, workers, peasants in other parts of the world, land defenders, all, all of that sort of thing. And I think that's a pretty important lesson that we learned from Chomsky, which is like very much related to this. It's wealthy, it's wealthy executives mm -hmm. in the US who profit from the murder of indigenous people and activists and de land defenders in places like Brazil and the Philippines, for example, which are two of the Union worst places. Union organizers at the yeah. Coke plants in Guatemala and, and yeah. El Salvador and places the, like that. The, I, the, I, the, vic the victims of Chiquita Banana, formerly known yeah. as United Fruit. Yeah. No, this is, I discovered him, Chomsky, in the 80s, around the same time that Reagan was waging this brutal war on the Central American government, like the Sandinista Nicaragua attacking the uprising in, in El Salvador and Guatemala and, and elsewhere. And around that time, I also discovered his essay, The Responsibility of Intellectuals, which it's hard to say something is the most famous thing you did, but that might be. And when that masterclass interview, God, I wish those that would go out. I wish the whole thing would, would be put out there. But I spoke to him for quite some time, 45 minutes to an hour, just about this particular idea of responsibility of intellectuals. It was a famous essay he wrote in 1967, which uh, we're going to show a clip of this in a minute which I did not know, actually began as an essay in a, in a Hillel newsletter, right? The irony there, right? And yeah. in it, he talks about what as what our responsibility is as intellectuals. We can't really just say we're following orders. And so there's this kind of key line where he says, what we have to decide what we're going to do as we read every day about these atrocities, these horrors, these deaths in Vietnam. And I think one thing that as, as a professor, as a historian of Vietnam, I think people have now we lose sight of how brutal and horrific that war was, what the U.S. did. That was a massive atrocity, a massive war crime, right? What we're seeing today in Gaza, that was what the U.S. did in Vietnam for a really long time, right? And so the response of the intellectual says, what are we going to do when we see that? We have to ask ourselves, what have I done? What am I going to do? And we're seeing that today where people are reluctant to speak out. They're afraid. Understandable. You can lose your job. We have professors, even tenured professors are coming under attack, right? In that era, we just did a tribute to the great Bruce Franklin a couple of weeks ago who died. Franklin lost his job at Stanford mm. because he was defending the students' right to protest. And I think these are really critical ideas. This idea, intellectual self-defense, we have to be prepared. We can't back down. We can't be afraid, which is hard to do because clearly these people have power and they can mess with you. I'm, I'm at the tail end of my career. It's not that big a deal. But if you're a new professor, especially if you're not tenured, 
you got to lay low. You got to be really careful. Yeah. And you've been, you've had more than a few run-ins with the law, both home and abroad, right? <laughs> it's and, true. Uh, and I think that's really critical. And again, speaking truth to power isn't necessarily a literal aphorism, right? Yeah, people know what they're doing. The people who run, the, the folks you're protesting at the oil companies, at the insurance companies, <laughs> at the banks, you don't, they, they don't need you to tell them what they're doing. They're doing it, right? But we have to let them know that we know what they're doing and you have to let other people know what they're doing as well. And I must say, uh, sadly, the far right's done a way better job at that, right? As you pointed out earlier, Trump made famous this concept of fake news. This is what we've been saying for 30 years, right? Fake news, but it never took <clears throat> until Trump comes up with this idea that you know, the Democratic Party controls the media and they're out to get him or something like that. I think it's really critical to understand this idea that not just intellectuals, not just activists, but all of us have a responsibility to speak out and to show moral courage or whatever you want to call it amid these attacks on what we do. We need to always in our pocket hold that concept that we're telling the truth. And it's not always easy. And I know we're going to show a brief clip in a minute, but I don't know if you wanted to add to that before we do. No, I think that hits on anything I would say. And yeah. And I, at, at the beginning of this part, I, I feel like I, I hit it pretty well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. What we're going to show you is, is from an interview, I asked him about that essay, Responsibility of Intellectuals. And so this is what he said about it. I have to look at the history of that essay. It appeared in a place which you'd never believe. It was a talk at Harvard to the Hillel Foundation oh. in 1966, which they published in their journal, Mosaic. Oh, I did not know that. No, Bob Silver, who was the editor of the New York Review, somehow got yeah. into it and asked me if I could write it up and add the footnotes and so on and make it look respectable for the journal. But it was aimed at the Harvard intellectual elite, the liberal, that's the liberals, the Kennedy liberals, basically. So, and it's right at the center of it. And how did they respond? I assume you didn't make new friends after that. <laughs> Not many. <laughs> if I try to... Fortunately, it's a mutual dislike, so I don't care. But, yeah. Um, it's not part of that society. Now, if, if you were going to write that today, would it be very different? I would have somewhat different choices, but fundamentally not. Yeah. I think these are long-term features of the intellectual community, which is just overwhelmingly subordinated to power. It's actually Henry Kissinger, who's a master of the art, put it pretty well. When he said that the test somewhere, in, I if he remembers exact words, but something like the task of the responsible intellectuals is to articulate the positions of the people in power you know, to put them in the right form, which of course he was doing. So if Nixon in a drunken fit says, let's bomb the shit out of everyone in Cambodia, then Kissinger tells the Air Force anything that flies against anything that moves, pure genocide. That's his job as a responsible intellectual. And I think that pretty much remains. One of my favorite articles, which you may recall, is by McGeorge Bundy in 1968 in Foreign Affairs, uh, right at the time that all this stuff was peaking. And it's about the critics of the administration policy in Vietnam. He says they're serious, honest critics who look at our tactical errors and say, you should have done it differently and so on. Then he said there are what he called the wild men in the wings, mm -hmm. the people who question our motives or who look at the roots of what we're doing as if we could be anything but benevolent, mm -hmm. magnificent people trying to do the best for everything. And that remains without a change. So it was pretty striking at 1975 when the war formally ended. Of course, everybody had to write something about it. And I reviewed it all. It was pretty interesting. The review, the views ranged from 
the right wing stab in the back didn't try hard enough and so on and so forth over to the left which is always the more interesting so way out at the left you get anthony lewis new york times can't go farther than that he wrote a very interesting article in the times saying which just captured the liberal intellectual mentality perfectly this is 1975 I don't have to tell you what Indochina looked like by then. Okay, but here's Lewis says, the U.S. began the war with blundering efforts to do good by definition, but by 1969, it was clear that it was a disaster and we couldn't bring democracy to <laughs> South Vietnam at a cost acceptable to ourselves. Mistake all along. And that's the way the war is looked at, even by much of the left. It's called a failure. Why was it a failure? It was a big success. They achieved the major goals. They destroyed Indochina. It's not going to be a model for anyone. They stole dictatorships in every other country in the regions that never spread, never compelled Japan to accommodate to an independent Southeast Asia. Substantial victory. Yeah. Even the left doesn't understand it. Yeah because they're all captured in the idea that somehow we made a mistake. That's the worst that we can do. We can't be rational imperialists. That is inconceivable. Uh, Some years ago, I think the 30th anniversary, I did an interview and I said, if, if LBJ came back to life, he'd say, hot damn, we won this war. It was a very interesting article quoting Bundy. Uh, I could find it in, in retrospect when Bundy, Mac Bundy, was talking about it, he said, we should have really stopped the war in 1965 after the Suharto uh, massacres in Indonesia, because that really meant nobody's going to fall, no dominoes. We've got the whole area under control, and all run by vicious murderers, so what do we need the war in Vietnam for anymore? We've talked for quite some time and we could go on for many more hours considering the various contributions he, he made and what he's meant to us. He's still with us, right? He hasn't been in the public sphere. He's had some medical issues and resting peacefully. But uh, we wanted to put this out there because a lot of people have been doing that. It's it's something that we were aware of, but it's now out there. It's been in the media and people are expressing how important he was to them and what he's done for them. We just wanted to contribute to that because this is a, a kind of life that doesn't come along very often. And we've been like really fortunate to have a very small part of it, be a very small part of it on the edges, right? And and so we wanted to just put this appreciation out there. And I don't know if there's any last things you want to say. By the way, if you're watching this, make sure you watch it all the way to the end, because we're going to play a, a longer clip of Chomsky talking about JFK, the legacy of JFK, which I think speaks to a lot of the issues we brought up today about liberals, about media, about so-called conspiracies and so forth, right? What liberals do. Uh, and also just because it's one of our favorite topics, to be honest, like we've, if, if we had to make a list of five, you know, things that we really were talking about, I'd say JFK is clearly close to the top there. Definitely top so, five, top three, yeah, maybe top yeah, three. Yeah, for sure. And uh, personally, that's actually means a lot to me because it's one area where I got to work with him more. I got to talk to him about it more. I actually became associated with him a little bit about it. It's really important. I think it's worth hearing uh, as well. for Because I've seen a lot of people now who would consider themselves radicals, consider themselves Marxists, consider themselves leftists, who still praise Kennedy. And so I do think it's important. It's a good way to end that. But before, I guess we're ready to go now, before we, we sign off. I don't know if there's any anything you want to say at the end. Uh, just, the, just that I, th I think there's a lot of important lessons that you and I and people who identify themselves as being part of the left have learned from Chomsky. And that's what we're hoping to lift up some of that today. And I, and there's massive influence on so many of us. And it's, it's just, this news has been sad and seeing the haters come out has been disconcerting and, but also seeing the the people who have been touched by him and it seems like it's thousands of people if not you're talking about people who have read his stuff it's millions of people who have been touched by him but but the thousands of people people have been personally touched by him i think it's just worth noting that he's had this larger than large impact on so many people and 
hopefully we'll have more people like that within the left who question authority, speak truth to power, call for intellectuals to be more responsible, and then and then question everything. As he said, the only option is to question everything. And I think that's important. Yeah, and on that personal level, I would certainly urge you to check out the interview we did with Bev Stoll, who was his longtime aide, who had yeah. a an insight to his personal life more than anybody else other and, than family. And read her yeah. book if you want to read, read it. Her book, buy, her book, buy her book and read it. And But yeah, he was just an incredible, giving, generous person. Didn't have an ego, which I still, I, I think that's when I talk about him. People say, oh, Chomsky's, I know a little bit. I'm not trying to brag. I like to pretend I'm his, you know, closest, if I'm not, right? But one thing that's always struck me in, in every kind of communication I've had with him is the guy has an ego. And if anybody could have an ego, it could be him, right? Given what he's done and the accolades he's received, but he never had an ego about it. He always cared about others. He was incredibly generous with his time. He was sympathetic. And check out the Green and Red playlist. We have an entire Chomsky playlist with, I think, 26 videos on it. A lot of them are interviews with him. There's an interview from 2002. I'm not an interview. There's the speech he gave in 2002, very prophetic, right, about the war that was coming, that was imminent in Iraq. With Bev Stoll interview, we talked to others like David Barsami and Clint Fernandez about him. So check it out and and appreciate him and don't quit fighting just because he hasn't been part of this larger fight in the last year or so. Doesn't mean that we can't keep it on. We're more involved, more obligated to keep it on. We can't sit back and say, oh, Chomsky will handle this or Chomsky will say something about this. We all have to, it's, it's going to take like a bunch of us to make up for what that one individual did. But I think it's really critical. And we're going to say goodbye now, but make sure you listen at the end. We're going to play a, a, another kind of Chomsky piece. And be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We've been posting a lot of Chomsky stuff lately on, on some of those channels. Yeah. And if you want to support us, go to greenredpodcast.org and hit the support button or become a patron at patreon.com backslash greenredpodcast. And in the spirit of Noam Chomsky, definitely go out and make trouble and misbehave. And we'll talk to you again soon. Kind of curious what you think accounts for the legacy of Kennedy. Um, he's now seen as this heroic figure, a peacemaker, a rebel, and people on the left, like Jacobin and Counterpunch and Majority Report, uh, have been giving a lot of airplay and a lot of ink to, to Stone's argument. How did Kennedy become such an icon for liberals, progressives, or even radicals based on what he actually did? PR. <laughs> Very similar to what happened with Reagan. And I rather suspect that Reagan's propaganda agents used Kennedy as a model. Now, if you look back at Reagan, he was not a particularly popular president. If you look at polling, sort of normal. Uh, after his death, there was a huge propaganda campaign launched, Reagan legacy, massive campaign which turned him into a godlike figure. I mean, it reached the point where you could uh, read a book by two scholars at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University uh, years later, who said that whatever our troubles may be, it's not too bad because uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, spirit is hovering over us like a warm and friendly ghost. That's scholarly community. Well, that was achieved by enormous propaganda, denying, playing down his massive crimes and atrocities, which was pretty easy because the liberal intellectuals also played them down. And, you know, they're just mistakes and so on, nothing really terrible. Uh, and, and, uh, concocting this uh, divine figure. Pretty much the same with Kennedy. You look at his actual record, it was awful. I mean, before the assassination, I can go through it, but uh, his, uh, he launched a major terrorist war against Cuba, terrorism, serious terrorism, out of hysteria after the Bay of Pigs. It, uh, he turned down Khrushchev's offer for detente of reducing offensive military weapons, 
could have led to a much more peaceful world. Instead, he reacted by the biggest military buildup probably in uh, peacetime history, though the US was way ahead. Now, those were the two factors that led Khrushchev to put missiles in uh, Cuba, almost led to the destruction of the world. Uh, in Latin America, he, uh, 1962, he shifted the mission of the Latin American military, which of course the US can control, shifted it from hemispheric defense, which was a anachronism from the Second World War, to internal security. Internal security in the Latin American context means, well, I won't use my words, I'll use the words of his special, his leading specialist in counterinsurgency, head of counterinsurgency under Kennedy and Johnson, Charles Machley. He said this signaled a change from tolerance for the rapacity and brutality of the Latin American military to direct participation by the United States in crimes that uh, you could trace back to Goebbels and Himmler. Well, that's the head of counterinsurgency under Kennedy. And he's correct. If you look at what happened, uh, Kennedy actually sent a, a special forces mission to Colombia, which was the scene of the worst atrocities. And they recommended paramilitary terror against known communist adherents, which means priests organizing peasants, human rights workers, and so on, led to a huge increase in atrocities. In, in Vietnam, when Kennedy came in, it was bad enough. The Eisenhower administration had been supporting a terrorist regime, which had already killed maybe 50, 60,000 people, uh, beginning to elicit resistance. Kennedy sharply escalated the war, 1961 and 62, uh, authorized napalm, authorized crop destruction, uh, began sending US Air Force planes under South Vietnamese markings to carry out bombing, uh, programs to drive uh, peasants uh, who the US intelligence knew were supporting the National Liberation Front to drive them into what amounted to concentration camps, strategic hamlets, where they could be so-called protected from the guerrillas that they were supporting, a massive escalation of the war. Uh, in fact, if you look around the total record, it's pretty awful. Then came the assassination, actually even before the assassination, the propaganda was strong enough so that he, public opinion polls, regarded him as one of the great American presidents. So even before the, then after the assassination came something that was later duplicated in the Reagan legacy propaganda. And we're now seeing right in front of us with the, uh, uh, adoration of Trump. Once you start adoring a political figure, all reason disappears. It goes into madness. We've seen plenty of examples of that in history. 